Our first story today takes us way back into time to two brothers, explorers and merchants, who vanished at sea in 1291. Vandino and Ugolino Vivaldi are not widely remembered today, but at the time they were known for being among the earliest to search out into the Atlantic Ocean, away from Europe. These two sailors were brothers, explorers, merchants, and they attempted a voyage from Europe to India via Africa. This is the voyage that they disappeared on. But first, let's cover a little backstory about them. Italian merchants Vandino and Ugolino Vivaldi were part of the first known expedition in search of an ocean way from Europe to India. The brothers were in command of this voyage. Their little fleet consisted of two galleys, a type of ship that is propelled by mainly oars and manpower. The purpose of the voyage itself was to reach India by the Ocean Sea. Not sure why they called it that. But once they crossed the Ocean Sea and reached India, they were hoping to bring back useful trade to Europe. At the time, it would have seemed like India was a world away. So I can understand that this was a major deal and there was a lot of excitement and intrigue for people back then for this voyage to be successful. So the voyage set off and it went well at first. They reached the southern coast of Morocco with no issues. This voyage was also the first one to set sail out of the Mediterranean and into the vast Atlantic Ocean since the collapse of the Roman Empire around 800 years earlier. So they headed out into the mighty Atlantic. And here is the mystery. They were never seen again. They vanished on this voyage. 22 years later, a Guianese expedition set sail to try to find the brothers, but no traces were found. And the son of one of the brothers also set out to look for his father and uncle in the early 14th century. And they reached as far of the Somali coast on this voyage, but tensions in the region prevented him from being able to go any further and search for them. The explorers are never found, and their ultimate fate remains a mystery to this day. Throughout the later years, even as late as 1455, the mid-15th century, rumors of their fate persisted. There were even sailors who claimed to have met the last descendants of the survivors of the voyage out in far-off lands. But this story should be taken with a grain of salt, as there is absolutely no way to verify it. But the story this supposed last descendant told was that the two ships were lost in the Sea of Genia, and, the, the, and those who escaped, whatever fate befell the ships, were stranded and later held in captivity elsewhere in Africa. At the time, their disappearance was a big deal. Think of it as the Mary Celeste of its day, and legends which were passed around told of the brothers sailing all the way around Africa and being held captive by mythical kings in the east, such as Prester John, a legendary ruler whose kingdom was lost amid religious turmoils in the Far East. I want to offer up a little theory of my own before we end this story off. Their goal was to explore the Atlantic Ocean, go around Africa, and reach India. So who is to say that maybe they didn't veer away from Africa and out into the west? Now, they were going around Africa specifically to explore the coast and reach India, so probably not, but just, just come with me here for a minute. I have an interesting idea, uh, even if it's just a what-if theory. So what if on this voyage, they maybe reached their goal, or chose to reassess while sailing down the coast of Africa. Then, what if, maybe, thinking they could find another way to India over the Atlantic Ocean, instead of going around Africa, they headed west. So who's to say that if this happened, maybe they didn't reach America, and then maybe died here or on the return trip to Europe? Most likely this isn't the case, and the most likely answer is they encountered some hazard at sea near Africa and were lost. Maybe wrecked on the rocks of some isolated shore, and those who made it to shore later died out in the desert or grassland wilderness. The skeleton coast in Africa is known for all the shipwrecks there, after all. And some areas around there are also known for treacherous waters, bad weather, and rogue waves. But it is an intriguing theory to think about. What if they felt the open ocean a straight shot to India over it, 
was better than a treacherous trip around Africa. No one knew a continent was in the way, so what if they thought it would be a longer trip, but going straight over the Atlantic to India would be safer? Longer voyage, yes, but maybe a less hazardous one. Because, you see, even back then, they knew how big the Earth was, so they would have known it would have been a longer trip, but again, maybe they thought it would be a safer one. Just think about it. Open ocean with no threats ahead, or a super dangerous ocean around the coast of Africa where it's known to be violent? It just makes you wonder, what if? At the very least, it could make for a very cool speculative film or book. But either way, on that voyage, the two brothers vanished with their ships and their crews, and they have never been seen again in over 700 years. Now I get it. These two lived getting close to 800 years ago, and to us, they're just distant names in history. They might as well have lived on a completely different world than we do now, considering how people lived in the 13th century versus how we do in the 21st. But these two were people. Once as alive as you and me, it's just as important to keep that in mind. Sometimes you can forget that when they lived so long ago, when they're just names from centuries ago long ago days we'll never know but they lived on the same planet as we do and their story should be told it's it's up to us to remember what came before no matter how long ago it was this next story is about a roman empress who schemed behind the backs of many before it ultimately came back to bite her. That part of the story is clear, no mystery there. What is unclear is how exactly she died. Different accounts offer different versions of the events. So let's go through the story, review the accounts of her death, and try to piece together what really happened. We're going even further back in time for this one than the first, back to when the Roman Empire was still around. This mystery takes us to 59, AD. Now on to the backstory. Julia Agrippina, better known as Agrippina the Younger, was born in November 15 AD. She was the daughter of Agrippina the Elder and the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero, the fifth Roman emperor. She reportedly had a double canine in her mouth, her upper jaw specifically, which was seen as a sign of good fortune. She was indeed one of the most prominent women of her time. She played a prominent role behind the scenes in the affairs of the Roman state, including moving her son Nero into succession for the role of emperor. Claudius learned of her plotting, but died in 54 AD before he could act on that information. Rumors suggested that Agrippina had poisoned him. But that is not the unsolved death we're talking about in this section. We're talking about Julia's unsolved death in 59 AD. Let's get to it. We don't really know what caused her death. There was a lot leading up to it, her relationship with her son being tense, I could say. Unhealthy, toxic, stalkerish, many of those work. It was tense on both sides. He actually sent servants specifically to annoy her. Regularly, too, if that tells you anything. And again, this whole backstory could make an entire video, honestly. But all surviving accounts of her death contradict each other in at least minor ways. None are completely consistent on the whole. So, yeah, we have totally reliable information here. Most of these are regarded as fantastical rather than historical as well. But there are constant events and story elements in each one. So maybe we can piece together the real story by comparing and contrasting all three and figuring out what remains consistent. So let's have a look at them. There are three accounts that we are going to go through. Maybe more existed back then, but they've become lost if they did. These are the ones which still exist today. I'll pop the name of each one on screen and then summarize that one. Then at the end, we'll compare notes. That's right. Get your notebooks out and start taking notes class. Our lecture 
is in session today. To summarize the first account, it begins in 58 AD. Nero had become involved with a noblewoman who taunted him for being a mummy's boy. Wanting to divorce his current wife and marry this noblewoman, Nero decided to kill his mother. Alright, well, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. His motive? Because such a move as that divorce would not have been politically feasible if his mother was still alive. Despite that, Nero did not actually marry this noblewoman, Poppea Sabina, until 62 AD, years after Julia's death. According to this account, Nero considered having his mother stabbed or poisoned, but he felt these were two suspicious methods of killing her. So instead, he built a boat, which was designed to sink. Okay, fair. No one could dive to shipwrecks back then to look for sabotage. This attempt, for all its complexity, supposedly failed, though, and Agrippina swam to shore, though she was nearly crushed by the ceiling of the boat when it collapsed. This account says that it was designed to collapse on itself and then sink, but the ceiling was stopped by a sofa, sparing her but crushing her attendant. Nero, once he learned she survived the sinking, then sent three assassins to kill her. And that's where the summary of this account that I read ended. A dramatic sinking ship story, but she was still alive. So let's see if the next one at least doesn't end on a cliffhanger, because I bet we're never getting a follow-up to this nearly 2,000-year-old text. This second account says that Agrippina's overbearing nature and her constant overwatchful and overcritical eye she kept on Nero is what led him to snap and to attempt murdering her. This account says that he did try poison, three times in fact, but Agrippina saved her life by taking an antidote in advance. Each time. Curious that she knew that he was trying to poison her and was just okay with that happening. This account also says that Nero's ultimate plan was to lend her a boat which was designed to collapse on itself and sink. He'd apparently gone all, here's Johnny, all over the other boat that she was supposed to take and damaged it so she would have to take the one he so graciously offered. So that's two accounts so far which have poison and then a self-sinking boat. Perhaps some of these aspects came from the same source and represent some clues to what really happened? I feel like the constants of these stories are things to keep note of. So be sure to write them down, class. Let's keep going and find out what else is consistent. She reportedly survived in this account too, and Nero panicked. Fair enough. And he ordered her assassination, making it look as if she had committed suicide. In this account, it is reported that Nero believed Agrippina haunted him for the rest of his life following her death. On to the third and final account of Agrippina's death. Let's see if this one follows some of the same beats as the first two, or if it goes on its own merry way instead. Like the first, Poppea was mentioned as the catalyst for the murder of Agrippina. One thing that is also the same is that a ship is again mentioned as being the cause of death. So it seems likely that unless all of these came from some false source, that this likely did happen. In this account, the ship was reported to be designed so that it would open up from the bottom while out at sea. Agrippina boarded the vessel, and after the bottom opened up like a hungry sarlacc, she fell into the sea. In this account, Agrippina also made it back to shore, so it seems like the ship assassinating plot failed in real life too. And another constant thing is that Nero then sent assassins to kill his mother. You know, I feel like that would have been easier. Like, you want to make it just look like a suicide or an, a or an accident, but building an entire boat, that's a big effort. He was really committed to that. I feel like you'd be way more likely to get busted building a murder boat than you are just paying some guy to do the stabby stab. Well, like I said, it sounds like a movie plot. But anyway, Nero also claimed that she killed herself. And this account adds that as the assassins moved in to kill her, Agrippina's final words were, 
smite my womb. Classy. But not unwarranted, since she was basically throwing a final insult to her son, because she wanted the part of her body that gave birth to him to be destroyed first. Nero viewed his mother's corpse following her death, commenting that she was beautiful before he had her cremated. In the following years, he had nightmares of her haunting him, and it got so bad that he had to beg the ghost for forgiveness. Nero wasn't the only one with the body count in this story. His mother had 12 known ones. So the mystery of this story is this. Which account of her death is true, or if none are accurate, then which ones have accurate aspects to them? Which parts are accurate? Due to these aspects being the same in all three, I'd say the ship trap and the assassin sent after this failed are true. And since it appeared in two of the three, Papaya being the catalyst and Nero attempting to poison his mother are also likely to have occurred. But ultimately, we'll never know which of these accounts are true, if any, or what really happened. But it seems that these accounts got all their information from one source. Is that source accurate, though, is the question. With this mystery, we can just use the clues we have and piece an account together. So, pick your poison, no pun intended, and decide for yourself what might have happened. Tell me which of these three accounts you think could be the true one, or closest to the true events. I'd love to know which one you think is the answer to this ancient mystery. And with that covered, let's move on to the next one. This is going to be one of the really short ones we cover today. This is one of those stories where there just isn't much information about it available. For a lot of these stories, we just don't know. And this is one of those. And it's also one that I wish there was more information about. The life and fate of Sebastiano di Gaetano has all the elements of a movie plot. Sebastiano was an Italian-born mafia boss who lived in New York City. He briefly even became the boss of the bosses of the Sicilian-American Mafia after the previous boss of bosses had been convicted of counterfeiting money in 1910. The boss of bosses is essentially the top boss. He can order around the other bosses in other groups, from what I understand, and not just his own. Shortly after stepping down from this position in 1912, he disappeared. This is the story of Sebastiano di Gaetino and the mystery of his ultimate fate. Sebastiano was born in Sicily in 1862. He later left Sicily and arrived in the United States in late October of 1898. He arrived alone, but his wife and child joined him by 1901. By 1908, the family had moved to the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, where Sebastiano became a barber. By either 1909 or 1910, Sebastiano is believed to have become the boss of the Williamsburg-centered Mafia, a mafia run by one of the five families who dominate organized crime in New York. He stepped down by 1912, but before doing so, he had some trouble with Salvatore Clemente, a Secret Service informer who was also a counterfeiter. Sebastiano had told him to refrain from his counterfeiting activities until another individual had been disposed of for suspected disloyalty. Because Sebastiano had been made the boss of bosses, he was allowed to place orders on members of different mafia crime families. He was the top boss of all the bosses. After Diagatano stepped down in March 1912... Salvatore claimed that it was because he had lost his nerve. Now, here is the mystery of this whole story. After stepping down, Digatano disappeared from history. No one knows his true fate. No one knows where he went or what happened to him. He just vanished from all historical records. But some historians have suggested that he might have returned to Italy with his family. I wish there was more on this one. I find the unsolved nature of this intriguing, since he was a noteworthy person and he just vanished completely. That's unusual. 
But again, there's just not many details. Whatever his ultimate fate was, we'll probably never know. It'll be a mystery that forever remains unsolved, like it has for over a century now. So that last case was a very short one, but thankfully this one has a lot more information about it. We're going way back for this one, even further back than the 1200s or even ancient Rome. This one takes us back to 524 BC because we are talking about the lost army of Cambyses. According to legend, this was a Persian army of 50,000 men sent across the western desert of Egypt by Cambyses II. Also, according to legend, the army was halfway across the desert to its destination, a city in Egypt that it was going to sack, when a sandstorm appeared which swallowed them up, and they were never seen again. Now, the mystery of this case is this. Did this army even exist? It's like the Orang Madan of ancient Persia. Did it exist? And if it did, what happened to it? Or... Is it just legend? They were supposedly buried by the powerful sandstorm somewhere out in the desert, but no traces of them have ever been found. Many Egyptologists consider the story to be an apocryphal one, meaning a story which the validity of is doubtful, but is also believed by many and is often circulated as being true. Many have searched for the Lost Army, and still do to this day, but for this video we're going to be focusing on the big investigations that occurred in the 1980s, and then again in the 2000s. So let's get into these a little bit and see what they found, and if they unearthed anything to clue us in as to if this army truly existed. The first expeditions in the 1980s is what we'll start with. The first expedition occurred in 1983 and into 1984. It was led by American journalist Gary Chaffetz and sponsored by Harvard University. The search for the lost army, or any traces of it, lasted for six months and took place along a remote 62-mile-long region of the Egyptian-Libyan border in an area of complex sand dunes. This sounds like the perfect place for an ancient army to have been buried. Participating in the expedition were 20 Egyptian geologists, a National Geographic photographer, two Harvard film students, and some of their supplies included three camels, a lightweight aircraft, and ground-penetrating radar to search for any traces of the buried army. They discovered 500 ancient grave sites, but no traces of the lost army. Some bone fragments which were found were dated to around 1500 B.C., which is a thousand years earlier than the date the army supposedly disappeared. They also found a small sphinx carved into the rock of a cave, which that's pretty cool. It was a Persian sphinx. So while they didn't find what they were looking for, the expedition was not a total failure. I'd be happy with finding that. So the expedition did not find any traces of the lost army, and I'll wrap that story up there. I'm not going to get into the whole political fallout, which happened right after it, Let's just say the Egyptians got an airplane out of it. You want to see how? You can look it up for yourselves. That'll be getting too off topic. The next expedition to find the Lost Army was in the summer of 2000. That year, a geological team from an Egyptian university were prospecting for petroleum in Egypt's western desert, and they came across well-preserved ancient fragments. These included bits of metal that resembled weapons, and human remains, and it was believed that traces of the lost army had finally been found after 2,500 years. The Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities announced that an expedition to explore the site would be launched and it would investigate it for more, and no other information was released. Another possible hit came in 2009, when two Italian archaeologists... Two Italians? Huh. Our Italian merchants from the 13th century must have gotten new careers after disappearing near Africa. Well, nice to know they didn't let themselves be kept down by one failure. Okay, that was a, that was a joke, but it's kind of funny because these two archaeologists are also brothers. These archaeologists announced that they had found 
human remains, tools, and weapons which dated to the era of the Persian army. These remains and artifacts were located near an oasis in the desert as well. And at first, this might sound like a super promising and exciting development, but these two have had doubts cast upon their claims. They presented their finds in a documentary rather than a scientific journal, and the two brothers were also filmmakers, known to have created shock documentaries in the 1970s, so their filmography doesn't inspire confidence. And I'm not going to mention some of the things that people witnessed in their previous films. Uh, trust me, you don't want to know. Let's just say that people didn't buy what they were selling. Now, a mindset I generally have and have voiced in my Loch Ness Monster documentary is that legends like this usually come from a source, a true source. So maybe a forgotten army really did vanish out in the desert or was defeated out in the desert, as a 2015 report suggested. And traces of it are just waiting to be found. Who knows? But you never know. So tell me what you think. Does this story come from a possible true source? And if so, was the army defeated in battle, or truly buried in some Goliath sandstorm? I think that the army probably existed in some form, and finding any remains of such an army, probably not as big as the legends say it was, would be hard if it was swallowed by the desert, be it in a sandstorm or just being buried after losing a battle. But again, tell me what you think about this one, and we'll move on to the next one. Jumping ahead around 2,000 years after the disappearance of the Lost Army for this next one, we have the story of the first murder in London with a firearm. A murder which has never been solved, and the perpetrator has never been identified. Once again, this is going to be one of the shorter ones, but if you're into true crime, you'll probably like this one. Our victim in this story is Robert Packington, the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth I's favorite Sir John Packington. He was born in 1489, and is remembered today for being the first person to be murdered with a handgun, in London in 1536. So let's get to the murder. On the morning of November 13th, 1536, while crossing the street, Packington was shot and killed. Now guns weren't exactly common back then. The general person probably couldn't afford one or have access to one. So whoever the murderer was, was likely someone who had connections or was someone from nobility, or maybe just a random person hired by someone of a higher class and given a gun to do the deed. Whoever this was, they went and got a firearm, meaning that they were probably someone with money, so I don't think this was just a random mugger from an alley. It was targeted. Maybe personal or political, but it was targeted by someone from the higher class, or even maybe from the royal court or the church itself. Here's a quote from the time. And one morning amongst all other, being a great misty morning such hath seldom been seen, even as he was crossing the street from his house to the church, he was suddenly murdered with a gun, which of the neighbors was plainly heard, and by a great number of laborers there standing at Sopper's Lane Inn. But the deed doer was never espied nor known. A great reward was promised for information that led to the capture of the killer, but Jeff the Killer was never found. There was also some fallout because of the murder by this mad gunman of 1536, because it was seen as martyrdom by Protestant reformers, and religious controversy spiked because of this. And reformers began suggesting that a, quote, conservative bishop was behind the killing. Others claimed the clergy was responsible. A rumor was started by John Fox in 1559 that a former bishop had paid a priest 60 gold coins to carry out the murder. Some of these aren't unfounded. Packington was known to be sympathetic to the reformers. But again, there is no direct evidence that this was the catalyst for the murder. And at the time, religion was a huge thing and religious persecution was not uncommon. Rumors and accusations continued for years 
but they get very political, so I'm just gonna skate right on by those. I don't do politics, even from 500 years ago, because someone would probably find a way to connect it to current things going on. But at the end of the day, though, all these claims are just that. Claims. The true identity of the killer, the mad gunman of 1536, has never been determined, and honestly, probably never will be at this point. Records show Packington's children were orphaned by the murder and placed into the care of the city. Packington's son was eventually placed into the custody of his grandfather, Sir John Baldwin. Pa Packington himself was buried in St. Pancras Church. And records tell us a monument was placed there in his memory, but it is no longer there today. So with that, let's move on to another story, our final of the day, and something a little closer to the modern day. Here's one more short incident I'm including before we wrap up. So let's set the scene. Close your eyes and imagine you're just living on your rural farm in late 19th century Kentucky. Maybe you're inside washing the dishes or outside hanging the wash or tending your field or chopping firewood. And all of a sudden, without warning, chunks of meat reported to be as big as four by four inches across began raining from the sky, plodding on your roof, in your yard, probably on you if you don't get inside. The meat shower continues for several minutes before stopping as suddenly as it began. The sky was clear the whole time, and a decent-sized area of several hundred yards has been covered by the stuff. Well, as odd as it sounds, that's what happened, and people just kind of seem to not care. Like, Oh, meat rained from the sky today. Oh, well, better go check the crops. Maybe I'll even eat some of it. Like, I, I think I'd be a little invested in finding out what happened and not just shrugging it off. On March 3rd, 1876, over a period of several minutes between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., what appeared to be chunks of maybe red meat rained from the sky over a 100 by 50 yard area in Bath County, Kentucky. People didn't know what it was. Some reported it looking, quote, gristly. The type of meat was also never determined, but there were a range of theories from it being beef, lamb, deer, bear, horse, or even human. With that last one in mind, it's a bit concerning that reportedly people ate some of it. One individual named Miss Crouch witnessed the incident and brought her story to the local newspaper. She was 40 feet from her front step, making soap, and said the following. The sky was perfectly clear at the time, and she said it felt like large snowflakes. And one piece fell near her, which was three or four inches square. She added that two men tasted the meat. Why? and said that they thought it was mutton or venison. The family cat also apparently found it tasty. More types of meat that were suggested after some more testing included it being lung tissue from either a horse or a human infant, which is concerning, and it was also suggested that it might have not been meat at all but cyanobacteria blobs. Miss Crouch and her husband believed the shower was a sign from God. Another theory involved murder. Okay, so you're going to have to listen to this. You kind of got to come with me on this one. It was put forth by some that the meat was actually what was left of two brothers who had gotten into a knife fight, and then a tornado came by Wizard of Oz style and sucked the carnage up and dropped it. Yeah, a tornado on a clear, calm day. That makes sense. I could not find the names of these supposed brothers as well, so I'd say take that one with a huge grain of salt that you're going to sprinkle all over the meat before you make yourself a tasty dinner. Another incident was also reported in Europe as well later on, which was apparently very similar. So apparently this is just a thing that happens. Now, what has to be the most popular theory to explain this incident is a theory that was put forth by an unnamed farmer, and scientists have voiced their support from even way back then, that the meat was the result of vultures vomiting up a recent meal. 
Turkey vultures are known to gorge themselves to the point they can barely fly, and in such a case they can lighten the load by regurgitating their last meal. If that's true, then people literally ate half-digested vulture vomit. And I gotta be honest here. With that big of an area, with that much meat, raining for that much time, and the sky reported being clear, the vulture theory just doesn't do it for me. I feel like people would have seen the vultures because of just how many that would have taken for that much meat to fall over that big of an area for that much time. Like, that would have been hard to miss. I'm not saying it was like supernatural, but I don't think the vulture theory does it. So I'll let you make up your own mind on this one. Oh, and also some historians are wanting to recreate the meat shower. So if you live in Kentucky, look up before you go outside. All right, starting off with one that is both really weird and really obscure. The Miracle of the Sun. In mid-October 1917, a large crowd of people were attending an event in Portugal, and this event was to essentially see the fulfillment of a prophecy. The prophecy was, essentially, that on the day everyone gathered, October 13, 1917, the Virgin Mary would appear and perform miracles on that date. So, on that date that it was supposed to be fulfilled, everyone came out and gathered to observe this miracle. Up to 40,000 people gathered together to observe this event. And right on time, the dark clouds blocking the sun broke, and the sun appeared out from behind those clouds, and it was duller than normal, and it cast multicolored light across the land, and it began to move across the sky and dance and do all these absolutely incredible things. The sun even appeared to fall towards the earth. Terrifying. And then zigged and zagged until it was back up to its normal place in the sky. And if you look at pictures taken during the event, you can see these people watching all of this happen are captivated and in awe. People who were there for the event also added that suddenly and completely dry as well as the wet and muddy ground that had been previously soaked because of the rain that had been falling. So, cool. The miracle happened and all is good. So, what is the mystery? Well, the mystery is the miracle. The mystery is, what did they see? What on earth, or off it rather, was going on in the sky? Well, first off, not everyone there reported that they saw the same thing. Some only saw radiant colors, some saw nothing. Nonetheless, there are multiple religious-based explanations for the event, and these include it being a sign from God, or the Virgin Mary specifically, and priest Stanley L. Jackie agreed. He explained that he saw it as divine intervention coming into play to cause a series of of natural meteorological phenomena to become enhanced and take place at the desired time period. He further went to explain that those faithful should indeed believe the miracle occurred on that day, saying, Those who stake their purpose in life on Christ as the greatest and incomparably miraculous fact of history, and added that those faithful need to pay attention to facts that support miracles. Skeptical investigator Joe Nickel concluded that he saw the dancing sun effect people witnessed as a combination of factors, including optical effects and meteorological phenomena, such as the sun being seen through thin clouds, causing it to appear as a silver disk. Other possibilities include an alteration in the density of passing clouds, causing the sun's image to alternately brighten and dim, and so seem to advance and recede and dust or moisture droplets in the atmosphere, refracting the sunlight and thus imparting a variety of colors. Also, the big thing people who approach this from a scientific perspective instead of a spiritual one have to say is, the sun doesn't do that. And that's true, it doesn't, obviously. Even hypervelocity stars don't move like that. Neutron stars don't move like that. Pulsars don't even move like that. They're weird, you know, but they don't do a whole dance routine, and the sun most definitely doesn't do anything like that. Quote, The sun did not really dance in the sky. We know this because, of course, everyone on Earth is under the same sun. 
And if the closest dying star to us suddenly began doing celestial gymnastics, a few billion other people would surely have reported it. Unquote. This is what scientific writer Benjamin Radford said. And fair, he's right on that. If the sun did tap dance in the sky, I think it would have been more widely noticed. And it also goes without saying, but even though we don't know for sure if it was raining at the time, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and assume it was. The clouds part and there's an aurora of colors. Sounds like a rainbow to me. But truthfully, to this day, no one knows what really happened on October 13th, 1917. So the weird thing about this story really is, what did they actually see? What did the sun do? In these pictures, you can see people are captivated. I feel like that this is something hard to explain with science. I'm not saying it was definitely supernatural, but the amount of witnesses and the accounts given of it, it's just hard to explain. I'll let you make up your own mind on this one. Tell me what you think it was, and we'll move on to something else that might not be the work of a higher power. Probably. But with this one, who knows? Maybe these people witnessed a super rare natural phenomena, or a rare moment where multiple occurred at once, like a sun dog and a crown flash and a rainbow all at the same time. Or maybe they really did see a direct act of God. Who knows? I'll let you decide for yourself. Tell me in a comment what you think. The USS Wasp. Yes, Spina, it is a good name. The USS Wasp was a ship that served in the United States Navy in the early 19th century during the War of 1812. Despite this being only decades into the existence of the United States, she is actually the fifth ship to already bear that name. The first sailed back in 1775 and was lost in 1777. The Wasp of the early 19th century was a sloop of war constructed at Newburyport, Massachusetts in 1813. She was launched in September of that same year, and then her commission began in February 1814. The Wasp sailed out into two successful raiding voyages against British trade ships during the war. One of the Wasp's big accomplishments came about when she happened upon the HMS Reindeer out at sea. Remember, the United States and Great Britain were at war at the time, so this was not a friendly encounter. In the following 19-minute battle, the British crew tried to board the Wasp several times, but the American crew pushed her back each time. Around the crew, bullets and cannonballs were flying through the air and tearing into each ship. Wood splinters would have been flying everywhere, and smoke would have been filling the air with each gunshot or cannon explosion. Finally, after a 19-minute battle at sea, Wasp's crew boarded and captured the reindeer. Wasp took six hits to her hull in the battle, but was still able to sail. Talk about a tough girl. Reindeer, meanwhile, had 42 crew wounded and 25 killed, including her captain, William Manners. The Wasp took the British crew as prisoners, and once they were off, reindeer was left abandoned without a captain or crew. The American crew also set fire to the reindeer as they prepared to sail away, and shortly after, the vessel exploded. From there, the Wasp set a course to France. Wasp was a short-lived vessel, but her history is incredible. There's more battles and epic stories to tell, but in the interest of keeping to the topic and not making this video an hour long, let's move on to the fate of the Wasp in autumn 1814. The actual topic of this section. The Wasp lived up to her name. Multiple vessels felt her sting, but in the end, being a vicious hornet could not save her from a mysterious fate. In September 1814, the Wasp came upon the eight-gun brig Atalanta and captured her. Wasp's crew deemed her too valuable of a ship to scuttle, so they sailed together for a time. On October 9, 1814, after parting ways, around three weeks after her capture of the Atalanta, and while that vessel continued on to the United States, the USS Wasp spoke to another ship, the Swedish vessel... Adonis, who had left Rio de Janeiro for Falmouth, England. They exchanged customary information, and Wasp in turn told the other vessel that she was en route to the Caribbean. 
and she was never seen again, as far as anyone knows. If any other vessel sighted her or encountered her, these were not recorded. Wasp's fate remains unknown to this day. One of the only theories that we have is that she encountered and sank in the storm. No matter the explanation or theory, the cause of the Wasp remains a mystery to this day and will likely remain a mystery forever. Though she had an active, if short, role in the War of 1812, she is not remembered by most. Today, she is all but forgotten. The actions of her crew, stories of anarchic calamity or selfless bravery to the very end when whatever fate descended upon them, all went down with her, and those secrets have never been given up. Going back over 300 years further into the past for the next one, we have the murder of Giovanni Juan Borgia on June 14th, 1497. Like with the Mad Gunman of 1536 in the last video, I'm not going to go into the full backstory of this guy, just the mystery around his death. You see, he was murdered, but to this day, no one knows who was really responsible for the act. We have theories and suspects, but no definitive answers. Let's get right into it. By the way, if the suspect we think is truly the one who did it, then this mystery has the ultimate backstab, maybe even literally. Juan Borgia was born in 1476 and was the second son of Pope Alexander VI. He had two children, a son and a daughter, and in fact his daughter was born in 1498, the year after her father's death, so she never met him. You see, on the night of June 14, 1497, Juan was murdered. He was last seen alive in this game of Clue, leaving a feast his mother had arranged in his honor. He left with his siblings, including his older brother, Joffrey, Joffrey's wife, their cousin, and his mother's husband. His father, the future pope, was not married to his mother for little context. She was his mistress. He then left the group to visit his own mistress. He took only his valet and a masked man who no one knows the identity of. Okay then, sure. Not weird at all. Later, he rode off with just the masked man, and his horse returned with a cut stirrup. Hmm. Here's a written quote from a diary that describes what happened next. When the next morning, Thursday, June 15th, the Duke did not return to the palace, his more familiar servants became restless, and one of them reported the late exit of the Duke and Cesare's and the unsuccessfully awaited return of the former in the morning to the Pope. The Pope was dismayed by this. He initially persuaded himself that the Duke was having fun somewhere with a girl, and therefore embarrassed from leaving her house in broad daylight, but hoped that he would come home that evening at least. When this did not happen either, the Pope was gripped by deadly terror. A search was launched, a witness was located, and the body was found. The witness, a timber dealer, said the following. While he was lying on his boat, he saw people come down to the shore at two in the morning on a public road near a hospital. Quote, They looked cautiously around to see if anyone was passing, and when they did not see anyone, they disappeared again into the lane. After a little while, two others came out of the lane, looked about in the same way, and made a sign to their companions when they discovered nobody. Thereupon, a rider on a white horse appeared and had a corpse behind him, with the head and arms hanging down on one side and the legs on the other, and supported by both sides by two men who had first appeared. The procession advanced to the place where refuse is thrown into the river. At the bank, they came to a halt and turned the horse with its tail to the river. Then they lifted the corpse, one holding it by its hands and arms, the other by its legs and feet, dragged it down from the horse, and cast it with all their strength into the river. To the question of the rider, if it was safely in, they answered, Yes, sir. Then, the one sitting on the horse cast another look at the river, and seeing the cloak of the corpse floating in the river, and asked his companions what was the black thing that was floating there. They said, The cloak. Thereupon, he threw stones at the garment to make it sink to the bottom. Then, all five of them, including the other two who had kept watch, and now rejoined the rider and his two companions, departed and they took their way together through another lane that leads to the hospital of St. James. He added, 
In my day, I have seen as many as a hundred corpses thrown into the river at that place on different nights without anyone troubling himself about it, and so I attached no importance to it. With this statement in hand, fishermen were called to drag the river, and Juan's body was recovered, still wearing his cloak, stockings, everything. It was found that he had nine total wounds, one through the throat, and all the others in either the head, body, or legs. Okay, we've played Clue. Now let's play Hunt a Killer. Who did it? Juan's wife was convinced the killer was his own brother, Cesare, and there was motivation there. A rivalry existed, and with his brother dead, he was allowed to leave the church and take up the position of man-at-arms, which he wanted, but he was never tried, much to the chagrin of his brother's wife. Another theory is that the killing was a revenge killing by another family who was hostile with the Pope. Finally, one other theory also states that Juan was murdered by his brother. Yes, but not the same brother we mentioned before. This theory states that it was his younger brother, Joffrey, over fraternization he perceived between his own wife and his brother Juan. Ultimately, just like with the mad gunman from last time, we'll never know for sure, and this mystery will likely go unsolved forever. Since it's such an obscure topic, not many historians are really looking into the clues to try and solve it. So tell me, which theory you think might be the one, though? I'd love to know. Let's move on to something much more recent than the late 15th century. This mystery takes us to the early 20th century. This one might be cheating a little. Let me know if you think it is, because... There's not really much mystery to this one. We know this guy's whole life story. What we don't know is what happened to him. This is the story of Albert Bert Alvord, a man who went from being a sheriff's deputy to a train robbing outlaw and ultimately disappearing with his fate unknown. This is his story. Born on September 11th, 1867, Bert's childhood was not one of stability, so to speak, in his youth, his family moved many times on account of his father's mining business taking them from boomtown to boomtown. Finally, they settled in the Arizona Territory. He lived what almost sounds like the typical Wild West cowboy life you see in the cliche western. He frequented saloons as an adult and got into many altercations at the bar. Despite this, he was recruited as a sheriff's deputy by County Sheriff John Horton Slaughter. Reports from the time described him as not noble, temperate, far-seeing, or unselfish. He did help Sheriff Slaughter, say that five times fast, in capturing multiple outlaws throughout the next few years, but his reputation as a lawman suffered when his alcohol problems became apparent to the general population, along with the fact he was associating with known outlaws and gamblers. In 1899, he willingly, but unexpectedly, resigned his badge, and now we come to the part of the story where this lawman became the outlaw. First thing Bert and his wife did once he'd turned in his badge, turned to crime. Bert formed a gang consisting of fellow outlaws, Billy Stilts, Bill Downing, and three-fingered Jack Dunlop, all of them individuals he'd once hunted down when he wore the badge. Their gang began conducting armed robberies across the territory before Bert and Billy were captured, but then managed to escape from custody. In 1900, Bert was again captured and taken to a town you all probably know if you know your westerns. Tombstone. Billy, however, rode to the town, wounded the deputy on duty, and allowed Bert and 24 other outlaws to escape. A year after chases and escapes, the fed-up Arizona Rangers chased Bert across the border into Mexico and finally captured him. Man, it's just crazy. How many of these stories could make cool movies, but just don't ever get to be? People complain we don't get original stuff anymore, but there's so much of it, though, that could be. So, following his capture, after this dramatic tale of robbery and shootouts, Bert spent two years in the Yama Territorial Prison. Following this release, he took a ship to Central America and was last seen in 1910 working on the Panama Canal. After this sighting, he was never seen again, and his fate is unknown.
just like the last one where we had our mobster boss of bosses who disappeared. When people, notable people even, just vanish from history like this, it just makes me really want to know what happened to them. And we will probably never know. The unsolved mystery of this whole story, what was Bert's fate? In all likelihood, we'll never know. Did he live the rest of his life working on the canal and die of old age in Central America? Or did someone who had a grudge against him learn he was down there and come to settle an old score? Did he eventually move back north, to Mexico, or even the United States? We don't know, and we probably never will. So, unless you wanted to speculate, any potential film about this guy, really one of you should get on that, is going to have to end maybe with him sailing off to start a new life. But tell me, how would you end that movie? What fate do you see him having? I'd love to know how you think this mystery ends. Bouvet Island, a thousand miles from nowhere, inhospitable, cold, volcanic. It's about as isolated as you can get. No one really goes there or wants to go there. You don't want to be there. If you get stranded there due to volatile weather, you're done. You don't want to go to Bouvet Island. You don't want to be there. It would be hard to get there. But someone did in the 1960s. A lone lifeboat from an unknown source was found on the shore of Bouvet Island. Some lost soul had found their way here. This is the mystery of the Bouvet Island lifeboat. In 1964, a survey team from the HMS Protector landed on the island via two helicopters to survey an area of land created by a lava flow in 1954. While the survey was ongoing, one individual happened upon something on one of the island's beaches. A single, empty lifeboat. The survey team found it in a small lagoon which had been formed by the same eruption that created the lava flow they were investigating. Due to the threat of potential bad weather to literally come out of nowhere, they didn't have much time to look into it. A picture was taken, a quick search for signs of human habitation or survivors was made, but nothing was found, and they left. The team's lieutenant commander, Alan Crawford, was the one who initially found the lifeboat and took the picture. There were also some oars on the shore that were found, no motor or sail to accompany the boat, but there also was a barrel and flattened copper tank. A later team that arrived on the island reported that the boat was gone. So, this story stirred up a lot of urban legends and myths and fictional stories of where it came from, and some even... <laughs> some even... As I can't say it with a straight face. Some even going as far as to saying it was from a Nazi landing party in the 1940s. Looking for the entrance to the hollow earth. Yeah, did Indiana Jones also come to stop them? Another popular theory was that it was the sole survivors of a ship, which had vanished at sea and found their way to the island where they met some ultimate unknown fate. But this is also not the case. So... If not a Nazi landing party looking for Agartha, or some unfortunate castaways from a ship that went down, what was it really? Who were the unfortunate souls that found their way to such an inhospitable place? Well, the mystery has been solved. One of the few in this collection of obscure historical mysteries that has been. I realize I've been focusing on unsolved or merely unresolved ones, but I don't really have to. Any obscure mystery is fair game. So, let's have one with a resolution. The answer to this one... It wasn't World War II related, but it was Cold War related. So, you could maybe write a Cold War thriller about it. Soviets looking for the entrance to Agartha, I guess. Because, yes, the lifeboat was from a Soviet Union ship. A Soviet reconnaissance vessel, to be exact. Page 129 of Transactions of the Oceanographic Institute, published by Moscow in 1960, appears to explain the whole story, and a Reddit user translated it as the following. The scientific reconnaissance vessel Slava 9 began its regular 13th cruise with the Slava Antarctic Whaling Fleet on the 22nd of October 1958. On the 27th of November, it arrived at Bouvet Island. A group of sailors landed and then couldn't leave in time because of worsening weather conditions and stayed on the island for about three days. The people were withdrawn by helicopter on 29th of November 1958. So, unless the Soviets were lying and covering 
up something else, the mystery is solved. Who knows what they were looking for? Maybe they really did find the entrance to the Hollow Earth on this little volcanic island, and those who did were never heard from again. It writes itself. It seriously, is creativity really that hard, movie writers? I came up with that after two seconds of brainstorming. Someone get on this one too. I'd totally go see this movie. I love this next one. It mystifies me. It is an ongoing mystery that is unfolding right now, but I don't see many people ever bring it up. The Ping. A short topic, but I really wanted to talk about it. The Ping is a sound coming from the Fury and Helka Strait. It is also known as the hum or the beep. This seemingly inconsequential phenomena is unexplained. No one knows the source or what it is or where it is coming from. It is a noise that was heard throughout the summer of 2016, and it supposedly scared the marine animals out of the strait. Hunters noted that there was a dramatic decrease in marine animal game that year. It has been described as an acoustic anomaly whose sounds scare sea animals. An airborne survey of the area was conducted by the Canadian military authorities, but they found nothing unusual and no sign of allied or foreign submarine activity in the area. No one was supposed to be there either based on their intelligence. The sound is currently being investigated by the Canadian military authorities. Currently, there is no explanation for what the ping was. Amelia Earhart gets all the attention when it comes to pilots who disappeared on a flight, but let me introduce you to the unsolved mystery of Toshio Kurowiwa. Born on Christmas Day 1908, he was a warrant officer and ace fighter pilot in the Imperial Japanese Navy during the 1932 January 28 incident between the Republic of China and the Empire of Japan. Part of the, I guess you could call, build-up conflicts to World War II. During the January 28th incident, on February 22, 1932 to be specific, he was assigned to the Kaga's carrier group. The Kaga was actually one of the carriers that was sunk in the Battle of Midway in 1942. He participated in the Imperial Japanese Navy's first shootdown of an enemy aircraft in combat, a Chinese fighter aircraft that was piloted by a reserve American contract pilot, Lieutenant Robbery Macaulay Short. While all this history is incredibly fascinating, like we've been doing with some of these others throughout this video, I don't want to get too off topic, so let's get to Toshio's mysterious, unsolved fate. Toshio was credited with shooting down 13 aircraft in his career, but the year World War II started in 1939, he was deemed too old to continue combat, and he willingly left and became a civilian pilot for the Imperial Japanese Airways. Then, in late August 1944, while he was piloting a civilian transport off the Malay Peninsula, he and the plane both disappeared. No trace of Toshio or the aircraft were ever found and have ever been found. Whatever occurred on that fateful flight off the peninsula is still a mystery to this day. Somewhere, though, Toshio utterly disappeared, and this mystery is still unsolved. I don't know about you, but when things just disappear, it really makes me want to know why and where they ended up. They're somewhere, but why can't they be found? Okay, our final one today is the kind of thing I love. A good old-fashioned ghost ship story, where a crew mysteriously vanishes, with all traces of them vanishing as well. Sometimes with incidents like the Mary Celeste or the SS Pacific, you can tell some kind of cataclysmic event happened, but no idea what. It's always unsettling to think and read about. You know, a ship just floating or sailing under its own power is just wrong. It's like the Orang Madan story, except for one big difference. In this story, it's not a ghost ship, but a ghost blimp. The L-8. The L-8 
was a United States Navy L-class airship, and her crew disappeared without a trace over the Pacific Ocean in mid-August 1942. The whole background as to why the U.S. Navy was using blimps is a lot. Part of it was for watching for any sign of a Japanese invasion of the mainland United States, which, yes, was a huge fear at the time, and I'm, I'm not going to cover all that backstory. Here is the story of L-8 itself. At 6.03 a.m. on August 16, 1942, the blimp lifted off from Treasure Island, San Francisco for a patrol. Around an hour and a half later, the crew of L-8 reported seeing a large oil slick four miles off the coast of Farallon Island. Boats in the region watched L-8 descending to roughly 30 feet above the surface of the ocean and circling the oil slick. This was the last sighting of the ship with the crew on board. After this sighting, they would all vanish. At 11.15 a.m., L-8 reappeared off the coast of Ocean Beach in the state you see on screen now. It's derelict. It's unsettling. It's completely abandoned. The dip was caused by helium gas filling the blimp from an open valve. This occurred shortly after the first sighting of the blimp being spotted abandoned. The L-8 continued drifting until it finally crashed in the front of a house in Daly City. So... How did the blimp end up being abandoned, and what happened to her crew? Well, there was obviously an investigation. Military and police were all over the crash site, just like they were after the UFO crashed in Roswell. Oh wait, that never happened. Upon investigating the blimp, they also found the control doors on the L-8 were open. And actually, the crash had been so soft that if the crew had been on board, they could have just opened the door and walked out. So let's go through the clues. The radio was on. So were the engines, but no distress signals had been sent at any point. It seemed that whatever had happened to the crew had happened very quickly. One thing the Navy investigated determined was that the L-8 was not shot down, burned, or made contact with the ocean at any point in the time she was drifting. The two missing crew members were declared legally dead in 1943. The official theory that was put forth was that the crew had slipped and fallen out while trying to drop a smoke marker on the oil slick. I always like how so many times in situations like this, it just comes down to ridiculous incompetence. That's always the go-to explanation. Seriously, read about the CAS 2 if you don't believe me. A few other ideas that were put forth, though, included that the two had defected to Japan and had been picked up by a Japanese ship, or that they were captured by the Japanese. Somehow. Another idea also included that they had attempted desertion, and it had either worked or gone horribly wrong. No matter the explanation, the mystery remains unsolved to this day. L-8 itself remained in service until 1982. Today, its control car is on display at the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida. A prehistoric mystery to start off, the dubious dinosaur... Tatan Caceratops, which might not even have existed in the first place. Yep, settle in, Spino, because you're going to have an existential crisis on this one for a dinosaur that is even more of a roller coaster than all the Spinosaurus drama from the last few years. This dinosaur lived in the Great Cretaceous, in the Maastrichtian Age specifically, in modern day South Dakota. Its name means bison horn face, and it was a member of the Ceratopsian group of dinosaurs, whose members include the very famous Triceratops. If it existed, this one wouldn't have been a direct relative of Triceratops, but rather a relative to an ancestor of Triceratops that it branched off from, but the two lived at the same time. Assuming this one existed. Oh, okay, okay, Spino, I will. Living around 66 million years ago, the dinosaur genus is known only from a single partial skull fossil found in the Hell Creek Formation that was dated to be 66 million years old, the tail end of the Cretaceous itself. This dinosaur had the characteristics of being an odd hybrid almost, figuratively not literally, it had the characteristics of an adult and a juvenile triceratops. However, the way the skull was hybridized, again figuratively, is where it's weird. The dinosaur's skull had the signs that you see in an old individual, such as gnarled bones and fusion in the skull, but it also likewise had these slender brow horns and the small nose that you see in juvenile Triceratops. 
Some theories about this animal try to explain this, and oftentimes the result tends to be that it is not a valid genus that ever existed. Some argue otherwise as well, so the status on if this dinosaur existed as we understand it is debated. Some theories about it include that the fossilized bones represent a dwarf species of Triceratops, which that would be cool, or that the animal is just a juvenile Triceratops species. Some paleontologists strongly suspect this. Subsequent studies do tend to lean towards the conclusion that the dinosaur genus never actually existed, and that the fossils we have were merely misidentified. Now, a friend of mine who is a bit more versed into the technicalities of paleo study of dinosaurs had some good comments about this when we talked about it, so I'm going to share what he thought. It honestly looks like this one is basically not a genus. This one isn't totally cut and dry, but it doesn't leave much room when it's been treated as a juvenile triceratops for more than a decade. It's just another nanotyrannus situation. Ontogeny is hard with fossils, and not everyone looks to ontogeny when describing new finds right away. You really have to know juvenile animals well, something tough when crocodiles and birds have dramatically different ontogenies. So for now, this obscure, unsolved topic sits on the shelf of... We don't know. We don't know if Tatankaceratops as a genus actually existed, or if the fossil is merely a misidentified juvenile Triceratops. Given that the secret has been buried for 66 million years, the answer might take another 66 for it to be dug up again. In 1922, a man who had been born into poverty, but had risen above it to a higher class, and was descended from a very wealthy family line consisting of landowners and soldiers, and one of his ancestors even saved an important viceroy from assassination in 1800, disappeared without a trace, and to this day, 101 years later, he has never been found, nor has any trace of him ever been found. Alejandro Nicolas Savadero was born on April 2nd, 1901, in Buenos Aires in the San Telmo neighborhood. His parents, Juan and Elena, were living in a high-class area at the time of Alejandro's birth, but the Long family fortune had essentially completely dried up, and they might very well have been masquerading as if they were still wealthy. If they kept, kept it a facade at all, that is. Alejandro was poor during his childhood. His father just worked as a teacher at a secondary school, and his mother was a seamstress. However, the parents made sure that they gave their son the best upbringing they could in the circumstances. Alejandro's father made sure that he got a good education, and his mother was a gifted storyteller who told long tales of the family history and legacy of the line that he had been born into. Beginning in 1919, Alejandro began to attend classes at the University of Buenos Aires. While here, his love and appreciation for poetry really came out, and he joined a poetry group in the university. In this group, he even met someone who was the grandson of an individual who had fought in the Battle of Pavon in 1861, which Alejandro's grandfather had also fought in. He also learned from this group that there was a chance a letter his great-grandfather had written might be in an archive somewhere. And that was significant because it was... If found, it would give the family a lot of land. Alejandro searched in multiple archives for this letter, but the only record of his great-grandfather that he ended up finding was not a letter, but instead a paper listing that he was on a supply ship called the San Nicola, which had actually disappeared back in 1807, on the way to another city 600 miles to the north. His great-grandfather was later found to be one of the only survivors who were ever located. He never did find the letter that his great-grandfather supposedly left behind that would give his descendants much stability and land and wealth. If that ever even existed at all is another mystery, but not the topic of this story. So that brings us up to September of 1922, and the weeks leading up to this, after his visits to libraries and archives were turning up nothing, his friends noted that he stopped attending the artist meetings, and he was almost always seen in an elevated state of agitation or excitement. It is thought that these lines he wrote actually serve as a peek into his mind at the time. Fortune wrapped in shining lies, too much for you to spend. Truth rests under unmarked graves, how much was buried with it. Finally, on September 22, 1922, Alejandro vanished. He left no note about where he was going and burned most of his journals. 
There were possible sightings of him in 1933 and 1941, and it's also theorized that an unidentified body found a year after he vanished was in fact his. Ultimately, though, no one knows what happened to Alejandro, why he vanished, where he went, or when he died. Or if he vanished of his own accord, and if he did so, then why? And perhaps someone had even intentionally hidden away the letter, assuming it did exist, and decided that he was getting too close to finding it, so maybe they made him vanish. All of these are unanswered questions. We have absolutely no, nothing to go on at all. 101 years later, and there are still no answers in this case, and that is unlikely to ever change. Alejandro was also a writer of poetry, and in his lifetime he produced one written work of poetry. Febrero Enero, meaning February, January. And the short story, The Unfortunate Son, was also published five years after he vanished, but if that one was actually written by him is also unknown. This Danish-British built five-masted bark saw use as a navy vessel for the training of youth cadets, and she was the largest sailing vessel in the world. Her five masts made her easily recognizable and would be a key part to this story. The Copenhagen was built from 1913 to 1921 and weighed almost 4,000 gross registered tons. From 1921 to 1928, she made nine commercial voyages to circumnavigations of the globe and visited nearly all the continents. Her maiden voyage was, in fact, a grand one. She circumnavigated the globe on that first trip, doing it in just over a year, starting in September 1921 and ending in November of the next year. Ironically, she was actually en route to Buenos Aires, of all places, on what ultimately became her final voyage. On this trip, her captain was... Hans Andersen, and there were a grand total of 75 people on board. They were carrying a cargo of chalk and bagged cement, which was bound for Buenos Aires. And they were, in turn, going to pick up another cargo there and take it to Melbourne. And there they would pick up a third cargo, which they would take back to Europe. She made it safely to Buenos Aires on November 17th, 1928, and her scale was impressive to the locals. Her cargo was unloaded, and she finally left again on December 14th, sailing for Australia with no cargo. She was due to arrive in 45 days. Eight days after she left port, she exchanged radio messages with a Norwegian steamer called the William Blummer, and according to her, she was 900 miles from a remote set of volcanic islands in the southern Atlantic Ocean. She said, all was well. And then she was never heard from again. The Blummer attempted to contact the ship again only a few hours after the first communication, but there was no response, so whatever happened, happened in just a few hours of time, and what had happened resulted in the crew having no time to call for help. That's what's weird here. This isn't like the Waratah, which didn't have a radio. This ship did, so why was there no call for help? Why did she drop out of contact as if the whole crew had just vanished into thin air? A search set out for the ship right away when contact was lost. Thank goodness, because I've read too many stories now where everyone just assumed things were fine and did nothing for days, weeks, or even months before they even started to assume something was wrong. But in this case, despite setting out right away to look for the ship, nothing was found. The Copenhagen was just gone. Her captain was known for having periods of long radio silence, but after months, people knew something was wrong, especially since the trip was only supposed to take 45 days. A ship called the Mexico was sent to that remote set of islands that the ship had radioed about, and the locals there reported that on January 21st, 1929, they had seen a ship drift past that seemed to be abandoned. And what was it about this ghost ship that people saw that was significant to the mystery of the Copenhagen? All of the descriptions of the derelict ship shared one key detail. They all said the ship they saw had five masts. The foremast was apparently broken, but she had five. The Mexico searched for seven months along with the Royal Navy, but no trace of the ship was ever found. The Copenhagen might have kept sailing for a time after that last sighting if it was indeed her, but for how long and where she ended up is a mystery. And if that was her sailing by, that is even stranger, because that means she didn't sink. So why did the crew not call for help when whatever calamity occurred?
Theories to explain this ship's loss, she was officially declared lost after seven months, include the ship striking an iceberg, but again, why wouldn't they call for help? Even in a rapid sinking, there should have been time to send something, anything, even just, you know, a guess on the position. Even that's wrong. A call for help to the general area is better than nothing. But if the ship the locals had seen on the island was her, then she did not sink and she kept sailing. But then there's also the question of, aside from ignoring the fact there was no call for help, if that was the Copenhagen drifting by, what happened to the crew? It's eerie when people just vanish, but the ship is still there. More so, even, in a situation where there's a radio on board. There were also several possible sightings of the ship floating in the ocean for the next several years, further supporting the idea that she did not sink. In 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter saw a five-masted ship floating by in a gale, which that's kind of creepy. Other sightings also reported her off the coast of Peru. A piece of wreckage with the ship's name also was reportedly found in Western Australia. There is also another aspect of this mystery that ties into another location we covered in this series, Bouvet Island. Again, of all places, I can't believe that one's getting brought up again in another mystery. Supposedly, in 1934, a message in a bottle washed up there from the Copenhagen, and it was found on Bouvet Island. The messages were actually a cadet's diary, and it claimed that the ship had been destroyed by many icebergs and she was being abandoned, with her crew taking their chances in the boats. But again, why no message on the radio? Also, in 1935, the remains of a lifeboat complete with a human skeleton were found along the southwest coastline of Africa. These might have been from the Copenhagen. Where the ship ultimately came to rest, be it on the shores of some island or at the bottom of the ocean or the coastline of some country, is a total mystery. The wreck has never been found and likely would be found only by random chance if it ever was. That is only a hopeful notion, though. The answer to this mystery will likely never be known. First off, I am going to show the picture of one of these bodies, and it is something people might find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised, but as I feel this is important for the science and the history, I think it is good to show it. Also, this is purely for an educational purpose, but if you don't want to see it, skip to the next section. The video is in chapters, and it is easy to go right to the next section if you don't want to. I understand if you don't, and I'll see you there. Right, here we go. Last chance to skip if you don't want to see. So this is one of the six Gabaline pre-dynastic mummies. The six are naturally mummified bodies that all date to right around 3400 BC from ancient Egypt. The bodies were buried in shallow graves in the fetal positions, common in Egyptian burial from the time. Two were male, one was female, and the others are all unknown. With the bodies were jars. The decorated jars were placed next to the mummies themselves. Gabaline man was one of the six mummies, and in November 2012, a study of him revealed that he had, in fact, been murdered. His murder and why it occurred are complete, unsolved mysteries, but from a CAT scan, we have found undisputable puncture wounds on the body. The murder weapon itself was used with high force to, to the point that his shoulder blade was actually damaged. It also shattered a bit beneath and punctured a lung, all from one blow. The weapon itself was likely a copper blade or a flint knife of some kind. The current theory is that he was jumped in a surprise attack, so maybe a robbery, or maybe it was a personally motivated killing. For all we know, the killer also got away with it, or maybe even the killers. This case is the definition of an obscure historical mystery. This is not one that a lot of people seem to know about, and there is no way to solve it. We have no idea who this guy was. We have no idea who murdered him, what their motive was, if they knew him or not, if it was just random. And because of all those unknowns, this is also just a case where there's just not a lot of information. As I said, we have no idea who this man was, who killed him, why, or if they were ever caught. 
Why this man was murdered and by whom is a secret long lost to time, and one that will never be answered. Now, the topic of these mummies as a whole is a fascinating topic that could and possibly will get its own video in the future, so consider this a teaser for it because these are fascinating. Another murder that has never been solved, this time from 1682, and in this case, there are suspects, but no one was ever identified as the killer. So Antonio Stradella was a freelance composer who was born in 1643. He was known for writing commissions, working with distinguished poets and collaborations, and he produced over 300 works in his lifetime, covering many genres. A lot of the details of his early life have been either shakily recorded or just outright lost to time, but we know a few details such as his father's name and that he received education in Rome. By age 24, he was already becoming known as a composer, and in 1667, he composed a new, now lost, Latin oratorio. In the early 1670s, he collaborated in writing operas at the Tordenoa Theater. For these, he composed things like the prologues. He also composed operas around this time for aristocratic families that were performed in private theaters. Y'all probably don't really care about any of that, though. You're here for the mystery of the story, so let's get right to it. About a decade after he composed those works we were talking about, in 1682, he was stabbed to death while walking home with a servant of his who had his hands full of cake. He died at the scene before he could even speak. What we know, as I said suspects exist, is that a member of a wealthy family hired someone to kill Stradella, but who the killer was has never been solved. Despite his murderer never being found, there are theories. One report from the time of his murder even states, Stradella was murdered by three brothers whose sister he had seduced, but if this is true is unknown, and Stradella himself is buried at a Roman Catholic Basilica church in Genoa, Italy, that was built in the 10th century. And we are no closer to finding out who the killer was than they were 300 years ago, and this one remains one of those many unsolved mysteries that we are left with nothing to go on and don't have a lot of information to go over either, and it's unlikely to ever change either. Let's revisit much more recent history for the next couple. The Douglas C-47 Skytrain was a military transport aircraft developed from the Douglas DC-3 airliner and it was extensively used in World War II. The first flight of one occurring in December 1941. The specific plane we are looking at in this unsolved mystery crashed into the ocean in 1945 and left a chilling final message before all contact was lost. The story of this specific Douglas C-47B plane started when it was assigned to the Royal Australian Air Force in March 1945, assigned to 35 Squadron, designated as an RAAF Ambulance Aircraft A-6583, with its call sign being VHCIZ. On December 18, 1945, the aircraft was en route to Darwin, the capital city of the North Territory of Australia, being piloted by Officer Francis Robinson. It left the island of Ambon at 10.40 a.m. that morning, and an hour later it requested to place a message. Darwin Airfield gave the plane the go-ahead to send it, but there was no response. The next day, on December 19, 1945, the plane was near the island of Timor over the Banda Sea, flying through a storm. A message was sent from the plane saying its passengers and crew, total of 26 people, were, quote, alive. All alive, waiting to be picked up. Second message was also sent, but it was too garbled to make anything out other than the VHCIZ call sign. Two days later, there was one more message a civilian engineer picked up that simply said, Darwin from Timor, waiting to be picked up. And that was it. No wreckage was ever found, and no trace of the plane or the people have ever been found. The Australian Defense Force refused to investigate the case, so stick it to those who might have been stranded somewhere, I guess. This is weird. This sounds like, considering how long that they were calling out, that they had to land somewhere and were waiting to be rescued, but obviously that rescue never came. And who's to say some of them didn't wait decades for rescue that would never come? And I'm not one for making conspiracy theories or anything, but 
why have the local authorities flat out refused to ever look for the plane? That That's weird. That makes this almost sound like there's a cover-up happening. And that just makes it one of these weird, strange mysteries from World War II that will likely never be solved unless a private search happens to find the plane. Watch, it's going to be sitting on an island somewhere and has been all this time. Who knows? But for whatever reason, the plane disappeared, called out for days, stating everyone was waiting to be picked up as if it had landed somewhere, went radio silent, and to this day the authorities refuse to investigate why. So draw your own conclusions from that, and let's move on to the next one. Our next entry involved a plane crashing into the sea with no apparent cause. Yes, Spino, I know, planes don't do that for no reason, but the reason is the mystery. Flight 240 was a regular service aircraft taking people from Hungary to Lebanon. In 1975, during what should have just been any other normal flight, the plane was coming in for its regular landing procedures when suddenly it didn't land. Instead, it crashed into the Mediterranean Sea, just off Lebanon's coast. All 60 people on board were killed, and no statement into the crash was ever made publicly. A report on the crash was rumored to have been written later in 2003, but it was ordered to remain top secret for reasons unconnected to the crash. Again, not one to make conspiracy theories, but that is also weird. That's very weird. Why are they being so secretive about this plane that crashed just off the coast? Who or what was on that plane that warrants such a response? According to a Hungarian TV station in a documentary that aired in 2008, there was allegedly documentation of a search and rescue mission that recovered 15 bodies. But again, no public statements were ever made, and all the documents regarding this case are sealed. Now, one reason for this comes from an unidentified witness to the event who said... The plane did not crash, but it was shot down. British military pilots and radar operators all claimed this too. So, again, I'm just going to let you make your own conclusions on this one. But if you ask me, there's something going on here. And someone, somewhere, wants to keep something hidden. The only question is, who? And what are they hiding? All right, now we're getting into some really, really obscure ones that don't have hardly any information about them, so we're going to start flying through these pretty quick. We're going way back in time for this one. Not to the Cretaceous again, or even ancient Egypt, but instead, the 3rd century of the AH dating calendar, which is actually a different dating system than the common calendar, AD or CE. With those, the date would actually be 834. Still a long time ago, though. Now, I'm going to try to pronounce this guy's name, but in case I get it wrong, I'm going to put it on screen. Muhammad Ibn al-Qasim was an individual with not much surviving information about him. We don't even know his date of birth beyond it being in the 3rd century AH. And he ends up vanishing from history as a fugitive on the run. But I would, I would say it's safe to assume he's probably dead by now. Muhammad led a rebellion in the early 3rd century, and he was defeated in this rebellion and promptly arrested. So, good job, dude. He was detained in the palace of the ruler he had rebelled against in Baghdad, but Muhammad escaped, fled, and was never seen again. He vanishes from all historical records, and what his fate was is completely unknown. And that is literally all the information about him that survives. A very obscure historical mystery indeed. Wonder what happened to him after he went on the run. We're going back just under another century further than the last one to 753 CE to talk about, and please don't burn me at the stake if I mispronounce this name, I really tried to learn how to pronounce it, Vijay Arita II, and the fact that he just disappears from history randomly. He was the crown prince of an ancient classical dynasty in India and was born in 738 AD, and he was the crown prince of the dynasty until its destruction and fall. Before then, though, Vijay Adita had grown up in a time when his father was plagued with intense outside pressure, including from the Rashtrakutas in the north. In 753, they would be the ones to destroy the dynasty. So this is 
obviously going to be a very summarized version of what is a lot of very complex history, and I'm just going to get straight to the mystery part of this whole story. When the Rashtrakuta army reached the capital of the dynasty in 753 AD, Vijayadatta II and his wife escaped the fall of the city by fleeing to the Ganga territory, which is where his wife was actually from. She was a princess from that kingdom. For years they lived there until in 774 AD, Vijayadatta left for a journey to the north and he just disappears. Yep, Spino, he just disappears from recorded history and is never heard from again. This is probably only a mystery because the records of what happened to him after this point have just been lost. He was an important figure for his time, so there's no way that just nothing was ever written down. But because of the fact that this historical figure does just abruptly vanish, and whatever his fate was is now an unsolved mystery, it fits perfectly into this video. But since we know he had descendants some 220 years later, he clearly didn't die on whatever this journey to the north was and he lived a full life the records are just lost leaving us with a mystery that really shouldn't be a mystery but is because a piece of the story is missing so we're just left with a weird case of an incomplete story for this one that will likely never be solved i also hope that i didn't terribly mispronounce any of these recent names if i did please feel free to correct me in the comments i'd love to learn how they're meant to be said these last two were just really hard to find information on in English, and there's not much in English about them, so even hearing the name said correctly was not an easy task. Thankfully, I'm in my element for the next one. Alright, those last two were hard to find information on in English. Thankfully, this next one, however, was not. And while there is still not a whole lot of noteworthy information to cover, this one was one of my favorites of the video. A good old maritime mystery for the last one of the video. Y'all always seem to love these, so let's have another one. And, fittingly, a very obscure one. The City of London was a passenger steamship that belonged to the Inman Line. And if you've been around for a while, we've covered a few ships from this line before. They didn't have the best track record, with both the City of Boston and the City of Glasgow disappearing, both of which were also Inman Line ships. And these aren't their only ones to go missing, either. The City of London herself existed in that what I've called the hybrid phase of steamships when they were being transitioned from sail to steam power. She was built in 1863 by Todd and McGregor. She was a striking ship with three masts and a single funnel jutting up out of her deck. She weighed 2,801 gross registered tons, had a compound engine, a single shaft, and one screw. Her career was not particularly eventful, and it was smooth sailing for her for nearly 20 years. Then, in November of 1881, she departed New York for London and was never seen again. There is absolutely no clue as to what happened to her, and no wreck or wreckage has ever been found. But it rests somewhere on the bottom of the ocean, undiscovered to this day. No theories really exist either, but it's possible that she might have struck an iceberg given the time of year and the area of the ocean she was in when she vanished, but storms, rogue waves, fire are all also possibilities. Either way, no matter what caused it, the ship disappeared and was presumed sunk, and all 41 people who were on board were never seen again and all lost at sea with their ship. The only way we could ever learn any clues about the loss would be if the wreck, or whatever is left of it, is found, because it still might bear the clues of what happened to her. Alright, a fun bonus topic real quick at the end before we end off the video. Something lighthearted for once in this video and not stories of people going missing, planes crashing, and people being murdered and never being solved. This one was also a last minute addition to the script, but it was too weird not to talk about. Plus, as I said, we've talked about murders, mayhem, and disappearances, and great tragedies for way too long now. So let's end on a lighthearted, but no less bizarre note. So there was this... Coke-themed vending machine on Capitol Hill in Seattle that operated from the early 1990s until 2018. Now, what's weird about that? Well, the machine abruptly vanished, but that's not all. Who stocked the machine for that entire time is unknown. Which, okay, that doesn't make any sense. How, is there, how are there no cameras? How did no one ever see anybody? No one has any idea who stocked this machine for all those years, but it responded to things as they happened. When Seattle passed a sugary drink tax, the cost for drinks on the machine likewise increased. 
And then five months later, it just abruptly vanished. Yeah, I know. It's weird. Also, the mystery drinks on the machine, uh, the, the dispersed, excuse me, were rare cans. The kind that are ordinarily unavailable and drinks and the drinks themselves consisted of ones you don't typically get in vending machines, such as Mountain Dew Whiteout, Raspberry Flavored Brisk, Hallo ha Hawaiian Punch. I almost said Halloween Punch. Next Halloween movie, Halloween Ends, Halloween Punch. The, the drinks consisted of Mountain Dew White Out, Raspberry Flavored Brisk, Hawaiian Punch, Grape Fanta, and there are claims things like Vanilla Coke and Sunkissed Cherry Limeade were also drinks that you could get from the, from the machine. But what else is weird about this machine is that you never knew what you were going to get. They were all mysteries. As you can see on screen, the button simply said mystery when you made your selection. And when the machine disappeared, a Facebook message went up saying, going for a walk, need to find myself. Maybe take a shower even. The machine reappeared in October 2022, but vanished again that December and has never been seen again. And it's just this weird, bizarre story. And to this day, no one knows who stalks or moves the machine around. It's definitely not a licensed machine either. And I bet there are conspiracy theories about this one if you look it up. But I do not have the energy or the will to look any of them up myself so i'll let you go down whatever rabbit hole exists about this machine because i know there has to be one somewhere